Hey everybody, it's Pastor Brian Ross from Grace Life Bible Church in Grand Rapids, Michigan. We want to welcome you to this midweek video. We appreciate you tuning in as always. In this video, we want to discuss an issue related to my co-authored book with Brother Dave Reed, The Myth of Verbatim Identicality, How God Actually Preserved His Word. And the question that we want to be looking at in this video is, did Peter S. Ruckman believe in verbatim identicality of wording as the standard for preservation. Again, did Peter S. Ruckman believe in verbatim identicality of wording as the standard for preservation? That's the topic that we're going to be taking up in this week's midweek video. Now to do this, I've been working on compiling a document here called Ruckman on Verbatim Identicality, and we're going to look at two tracks in this video from a series of audio recordings that Ruckman produced in what I believe is 1964, okay? I believe these recordings date from 1964. Now, the reason I believe that is because in the first track, and by the way, this series is called Greek Manuscript Evidence. It's a four-part audio series. There are four tracks in the series. Each track is roughly an hour and a half, and generally, that's the length of, of all four of these recordings. In the first recording, at the 5 minute 11 second mark, Ruckman talks about the minds of the public in 1964. So I believe that this recording, this, this series of four recordings, dates from 1964. Now, if you go to the Bible Baptist Bookstore, which is the place where you can buy Ruckman's materials online, uh, direct from his ministry, um, they're going to say that these recordings are from the 1970s on the packaging. It's not specific, okay? Um, I believe that they date from 1964 because of this statement right here at the 5 minute 11 second mark in the first track. So that being said, what I want to do is so that there is no misconceptions because I've tried really hard. I've listened to these tracks probably 10 times each and I've tried to construct an accurate transcript and every time I listen to it there's still a little detail that I catch that I didn't catch the other times. So what I'm going to do in order to make sure there's no misconceptions here or no um, allegations that I misrepresented Ruckman, I'm going to play the audio recording and we're going to start at roughly the 1 minute 45 second mark of track 1. So I'm going to play Ruckman talking and then we will trace along with what Ruckman says here in my transcript following my cursor as Ruckman works his way through the quote. And then after each quote, we will have some commentary and some thoughts about what Ruckman has said. And before we go into an actual discussion of these translations and versions, I want to state the real problem at stake and what actually is the real issue. And I'm going to be very dogmatic about it, as this particular issue is so crucial and so essential to proper Christian belief that there isn't even any uh, two ways of opinion about what the issue is. The issue among people who believe the Word of God is not, did God inspire it? That may be the issue with the neo-Orthodox and the neo-evangelical and the liberal and the atheist and the infidel and the agnostic and the Roman Catholic Church. But that is not the problem of the evangelical born-again believer. The born-again believer is not concerned whatsoever about whether God inspired it. All evangelical born-again believers believe that the Bible is inspired in the original autographs. And this is usually stated in the creeds and catechisms of these groups. The issue is not was God powerful enough to inspire it, the issue is, did God preserve it intact? Now that's the whole issue. The consensus of the opinion is that he did not. And the consensus of, of the opinion that he did not is based upon the fact that even those who claim that he did cannot produce exact similitudes in every word, paragraph, hitting, chapter, verse marking, punctuation mark in the versions they claim came from the same line. But in a moment in our study of the historical progression of the Word of God, we're going to find that this in itself is a gross error. 
and a verbatim reproduction of the originals wherever they are. It is not necessary to prove that what God said has been preserved intact the way he wants it said. Now that's a little difficult for you to swallow in case you didn't quite get it. I'll say it another way very plainly in a way in which you will get. And that is this. If you believe that what God wanted to say has been preserved, the only place you disagree with me or me with you is as to the instrument of its preservation and its present form. And that's what we're going to talk about. On this tape, I'm going to talk to you about the inspiration, preservation, and present form of the infallible, inerrant Word of God. So we'll stop the <clears throat> recording there. And I want to go back to the transcript and offer some comments. Okay. Now, Ruckman just said that the reason people reject the doctrine of preservation is because of the lack of verbatim identicality of wording. Okay. That's what he just said. I.e., notice, he cannot produce an exact similitude in every word. Now, that's not saying verbatim identicality, but that's a synonym. An exact similitude in every word would be the same thing as verbatim identicality of wording. So, Ruckman is acknowledging very plainly here that the reason why people reject the doctrine of preservation is because he, people cannot produce an exact similitude in every word, paragraph, heading, chapter, verse, marking, punctuation mark from the versions they came from the same line i.e., there is not verbatim identicality of wording, so therefore people reject the doctrine of preservation, okay? Now, this is the fundamental assumption of my, again, my co-authored book with Brother Dave Reed, The Myth of Verbatim Identicality. So what I want to do is I want to look at the introduction, chapter one, the introduction of our book, and show you the similarities between what we're saying and what Ruckman said in 1964. Now, just so we're clear, we did not base anything that we said off of uh, anything that Peter Ruckman said or believed, um, but the similarities are interesting, okay? So bearing in mind what Ruckman just said, let's look at the introduction, chapter one. The purpose of this book is to address some unresolved questions and difficulties related to the doctrine of preservation. It is widely understood that the extant Greek manuscripts contain numerous textual variants which raised the question of whether preservation has in fact occurred. That's the same thing that Ruckman is getting at in the recording track one that we just listened to. Okay? It is also universally assumed that preservation requires verbatim identicality of wording. And that <clears throat> foundational assumption has led to extreme positions at both ends of the theological spectrum. At one end, in light of the undeniable existence of textual variants, some view themselves as having no choice but to reject the doctrine of preservation and to confine inerrancy to the non-existent original autographs. At the other end, some affirm preservation but are not convinced that but are excuse me convinced that they need to identify which edition and or printing of the King James Version is perfect in the sense that every word, spelling, punctuation mark. Now again, notice the similarities cannot produce, from Ruckman now, cannot produce an exact similitude in every word, paragraph, heading, chapter, uh, verse marking, punctuation mark, okay? So we are talking roughly here about the same thing that Ruckman was talking about, okay? So there's people who think they have to get the perfect King James um, in the sense that every word, spelling, punctuation mark, etc. is uniquely correct, such that any difference therefrom must necessarily be wrong. We have come to believe, that's Dave Reed and I, that the scriptural solution is to reject verbatim identicality as the standard for preservation and thereby avoid having to choose between these two extreme positions. Many believe, including the, the authors, many believers, excuse me, including the authors, hold to verbal plenary inspiration, the view that God inspired every word of scripture. Starting from this premise, many conclude that preservation requires that those exact words must be preserved or else preservation has failed. It is commonly thought that any 
change in wording, even if the meaning is unchanged, is an inadequate and unacceptable substitute since God himself chose the original words of Scripture. Similarly, when it comes to translation, many conclude that there must be a singularly correct and perfect way to translate the original words of Scripture, and that any difference from such singularly perfect wording must of necessity be error. Given the importance that God places upon his word, Psalm 138 verse 2, it is understandable that many initially think this way. But sooner or later, one bumps into certain facts that cannot be denied. When one looks at the historical and textual evidence, one is confronted with the reality that no two Greek manuscripts, even Byzantine ones, are exactly the same. No two editions of the Texas Receptus are exactly the same, and few printings of the King James Version are exactly the same. For, for those adhering to verbatim identicality as the standard of preservation, these are serious problems. Faced with these facts, facts we feel forced... Sorry, faced with these facts, many feel forced to choose between two extreme positions noted, noted above because it has not occurred to them to reconsider the assumption of verbatim identicality. However, if we allow Scripture itself to teach us how to think about preservation, we realize that insisting upon verbatim identicality as the standard for preservation is excessive and unbiblical. In fact, the false assumption of verbatim identicality is at the core of the confusion that surrounds the doctrine of preservation. By adjusting one's understanding of preservation to match what the scriptures actually teach, one can avoid the problems created by the man-made verbatim identicality standard. A careful study of the text of the King James Version will confirm this conclusion. This book will set forth scriptural proof that God chose to preserve his word, not through verbatim identicality of wording, but instead through verbal equivalence. Now, this is a fascinating thing because what Ruckman is saying here, he said, let, let's look at it again, okay, and the consensus of the opinion that he did not, that's not preserve his word, is based upon the fact that even those who claim he did cannot produce an exact similitude in every word. And then he calls this a gross error. So, what Ruckman is saying is the reason why people reject the doctrine of preservation is because there's not verbatim identicality of wording, okay? In the next line down here, he says, a verbatim reproduction of the originals, uh, wherever they are, is not necessary to prove what God said has been preserved intact the way that he wants it said. So, uh, Ruckman makes, makes that statement, okay? So, translation, what does Ruckman mean? Translation, or in other words, or put another way, verbatim identicality of wording is not possible. So what, what Ruckman is, is saying in this audio recording from 1964 is he's asserting the, the exact premise of the book, The Myth of Verbatim Identicality, that uh, Brother Reed and I wrote. Now, I want to move on to the second track in, that we're going to investigate. And this is from track four. And we're going to start this roughly at the 28 minute 55 second mark. And before I close this tape, I'm going to make two more remarks, which I want you to listen to very carefully. And after that, you can rave on or cuss or blow your uh, gasket or strip your gears or burn out a clutch plate or do whatever you like to do, brother. It's a free country. I have no prejudice against anybody. It's a free country. But I'm going to say two things in closing. The first thing I'm going to say is going to be a shocker to some people who have gone along with me in this, this curses. And it's going to make some of you uh, Greek professors, if any of you are listening, wonder if I'm in the right mind. Because you haven't thought the thing out careful enough to actually know what I'm talking about. But the first statement I'm going to make is going to be along those lines, and the second statement I'm going to make is going to be the lines of uh, the history of the actual movement of the Holy Spirit in Europe following the first, second, third century. <clears throat> now here's my first statement. Right here. Don't misquote me. Well. I'm one of the most misquoted men in America. I don't say that from a persecution complex. I say that from experience uh, of checking people who said I have said things. 
first thing is, listen to me carefully. Right here. Just because the original Greek manuscripts, wherever they are, would not agree verbatim jot and tittle to the King James English version is not proof that the King James Version is not the inerrant, infallible Word of God. Now listen to me carefully. When I say that, I do not mean what a Greek professor says when he says it. When he says it, he means that enough of the truth has been preserved so there are no serious, major errors in the present text which we have. When I say it, I don't mean that. When I say it, I mean the King James Bible is the exact form and shape and size and content of the Bible that God wants the world to have from 1611 to the second coming of Jesus Christ, and that there are no mistakes in it unless the line atop linotype operator or the press that rolled it off has made a mistake in setting type. Now that's something to think about. And you're not going to understand it till I finish talking about the history of the movement of the Holy Spirit. You say, well, if that's true, Brother Robin, the whole thing you've been telling us breaks down. And you admit that it is not the original, the God-breathed Word. No, you spoke a little too quick and a little too foolishly in, in making that comment. Because you see, in your simple-mindedness, my friend, you have presumed from the very start that a book could not be infallible and from God unless it matched verbatim the original autographs. And there's where you've made a gross error. You say, Brother Ruckman, are you mean to tell me that God can change that book from century to century and it still be inerrant and infallible? Yes. So there you heard it straight from Ruckman's mouth that God can change the book from century to century and it still be inerrant in this recording from 1964. Now let's go back and I want to look at each one of the bolded statements here in the transcript, okay? In the first bullet section, Ruckman again accepts the fact that the King James Bible is not verbatim jot and tittle match with the original Greek manuscripts. Notice, just because the original Greek manuscripts, wherever they are, would not agree verbatim, him using the word verbatim, jot and tittle to the King James English version is not proof that the King James version is not the inerrant infallible word of God. So Ruckman says that just because... Um, he's accepting the fact, I should say, <clears throat> that the King James Bible is not a verbatim John Tittle match to the original Greek manuscripts. He, so he's acknowledging the, the, the fundamental premise. Let's look at the second bolded section here. Okay, When I say it, I mean the King James Bible is the exact form and shape and size and content of the Bible that God wants the world to have from 1611 to the second coming of Jesus Christ and that there are no mistakes in it unless the linotype operator or the press that rolled it off has made a mistake in setting type. Now, in the second bolded uh, section there, Ruckman asserts that the King James Bible is the exact form and shape and size and content. He uses the word content of the Bible that God wants the world to have from 1611 to the second coming of Jesus Christ. So according to Ruckman, it is the content of the Bible that matters. Now, that is a very interesting statement, but there it is right from uh, uh, Ruckman's own mouth that he is making this assertion. Okay, In the third bolded section, <clears throat> which is right here, because you see in your simple-mindedness, my friend, you have presumed from the very start that a book could not be infallible and from God unless it matched verbatim the original autographs, okay? And then he goes on to say, as we just noted, that do you mean to tell me, Brother Ruckman, do you mean to tell me that God can change that book from century to century and it still be the inerrant, still be inerrant and infallible? And notice his answer here, yes, okay? 
So in the third bolded section, Ruckman again admits that the presumption of verbatim identicality stems from notice, um, simple-mindedness, okay, and notice he calls it gross error, okay, when considering the doctrine of preservation. Then shockingly, Ruckman admits that God can change the book from century to century and it still be inerrant and infallible. So Ruckman was not a verbatim identicalist. All right. He knew that such a position was untenable considering the textual facts. He's saying that right there. He's saying that this is a presumption. He says, presume. Simple-mindedness, my friend, you have presumed. So he's, again, addressing the fundamental premise in the, in the book, The Myth of Verbatim Identicality, that it is the presumption of verbatim identicality, <clears throat> or the exact similitude, to use Ruckman's terms, that causes people to reject the doctrine of preservation. Now, in the context, one wonders what type of changes Ruckman would approve of. So he says here, do you mean to tell me that God can change the book? And he says, yes. So what kind of changes would Ruckman approve of in the context of this statement? Well, in the context of the statement, it would be changes that don't change the shape, size, and content of the Bible. Changes that would not change the form, shape, size, or content of the Bible in the context, that's what Ruckman would be saying, okay? Now, in 1987, a gentleman named Bruce Lackey wrote a little booklet called Why I Believe the Old King James Bible. Now, I want to read to you a few things from Lackey's booklet, okay? Starting at the bottom of page 31. So please listen carefully to what Lackey says, okay? Since God kept his promise to preserve his truth for all generations, the King James Version must be his word. Likewise, the Hebrew and Greek texts from which it was translated are the word of God, because they are the ones which were available, copied, and circulated during all these generations of this church age. So what Lackey is saying is that the textual basis of the King James Bible is also the word of God, because those are the texts that were available and in use by the body of Christ throughout the history of the dispensation of grace. Okay, In contrast to, notice what he says, God did not pr promise to make sure that every person would have a copy of his word, but he did clearly say that it would be available to all generations. That which was available was his word, and that which was hidden or lost was not his word. So, I take him to be referring there to maybe Codex Sinaiticus, which was wholly unknown to the body of Christ until the mid-19th century, and then used along with Codex Vaticanus to create the critical text in the 19th century, a text that there is no evidence that the body of Christ, that, a text that there is no evidence that it was ever available to the body of Christ or in use to the, by the body of Christ until it was created by text critics in the 19th century. Now, he goes on, this is page 32 now of Lackey's book, many object to this conclusion because various manuscripts within the Texas Receptus have different words. They are not all exact copies, but this objection ignores what the Bible demonstrates hundreds of times. When the New Testament quotes the Old Testament, sometimes words are changed and even paraphrases are made, but the meaning is the same and both are inspired, as is demonstrated in the following examples. Okay, Now, he gives four examples on page 32. We're just going to talk about one of them for the sake of time. And the one he gives is Matthew 123, which is a reference to Isaiah 714. This is talking about the promise of the child that would be born of the Virgin Mary, right? And it in Matthew chapter 1, verse 23... The verse reads, be with child. In Isaiah 7.14, the, the, the word is conceive. In Matthew 1.23, it says, bring forth. In Isaiah 7.14, it uses the word bear. In Matthew 1.23, it says, and they shall call. And in Isaiah 7.14, it says, and shall call. So there's not a verbatim identical quote or citation is what Lackey is saying. But he's saying that both of these are inspired, even though they are not a verbatim match and using the exact same words. So then he goes on to say on page 33, regarding this, 
He says, did the Holy Spirit violate inspiration when he changed these words from the Old Testament to the New? Of course not. Both Testaments are equally inspired. 1 Timothy chapter 5, verse 18 quotes Deuteronomy 25, verse 4, and Luke chapter 10, verse 7, calling both Scripture. It is significant that Paul would call the writing of his companion Luke Scripture along with the writings of Moses. Of course, when we remember that it was the Holy Spirit who said that through Paul, it becomes even more significant. Does this practice mean that God preserved only the basic thought? Does it deny verbal inspiration? <laughs> Perish the thought, is what Lackey says. Christ clearly taught verbal inspiration when he said, Man shall not live by bread alone, but by every word that proceedeth out of the mouth of God, Matthew 4.4, 4, quoting Deuteronomy 8.3. What it does do is give us many examples showing that God's words are still his words when translated. We may not fully understand that or be able to answer all the questions which may arise concerning it, but we cannot deny the obvious fact that the Holy Spirit used different words when he translated from Hebrew and Greek without harming inspiration in the least, to which we would say, Amen, Brother Lackey. And this is the principle that we have identified in our book, and we have called it um, verbal equivalence. Okay, so let's look at this definition. This is uh, from page 15 in the PDF, and let's see what page is this. Page 7 in the print copy, okay? To define the term verbal equivalence, we rely upon the following dictionary definition of each word, verbal, with reference to the accuracy or faithfulness of a transcription, translation, quotation, etc., that takes account of each individual word. The myth of verbatim identicality is still saying that the words matter by definition of the word verbal. So the words still matter. What we are saying, though, is that God has allowed for a more robust use of words where he can use different words to express the same doctrine, the same content, to use Ruckman's word. Okay, And then notice, and, and, and by the way, the, the, this book, only, the word content only appears once on the title page, the contents page. We are using the word verbal to, because we are saying that the words still matter. And then look at equivalence, okay? Or equivalent, having equal or corresponding import, meaning, or significance, chief, chiefly of words and expressions, that is virtually the same thing, identical in effect. So we define verbal equivalence to mean when the reading in a particular document or verse has the same uh, <clears throat> substantive doctrinal meaning as the reading in another document or verse, even if the readings do not have verbatim identicality. For there to be verbal equivalence, the words do not have to be verbatim word for word identical, but the words have to have, to have the very same substantive doctrinal meaning. The principle of verbal equivalence applies not just in English, but also in Hebrew and Greek, as will be demonstrated. So if you want to know more about that, please consider picking up a copy of the book, The Myth of Verbatim Identicality. I'll leave a link in the description to this video. Okay, So getting back now to, to Ruckman. Ruckman was aware of the problem. Let's get back to the transcript here. Ruckman was aware of the problem caused by the assumption of verbatim identicality of wording as the standard for preservation. He clearly was aware of the problem if you look at, if you listen carefully to these recordings from 1964. While he did not use the phrase verbatim uh, verbatim identicality, he used the following synonyms. Ruckman is using synonyms for verbatim identicality even though he's not using that exact word. The first synonym that he uses is exact similitude in every word. He uses the phrase exact similitude. And he says, we cannot produce an exact similitude in every word, paragraph, heading, chapter, verse marking, punctuation mark. Okay, So exact similitude is a synonym for verbatim identicality. 
The other term that Ruckman uses, that's a synonym for verbatim identicality, is verbatim reproduction. When he says a verbatim reproduction of the originals, wherever they are, is not necessary to prove that what God said has been preserved intact the way he wants it said. So there's a second synonym for verbatim identicality. And then thirdly, we have the idea of verbatim match. Verbatim match is uh, right here, matched verbatim, okay, or a verbatim match. And he says, you presume from the very start that a book could not be infallible and from God unless it matched verbatim the original autograph. So Ruckman is using three synonyms for verbatim identicality. Exact similitude, verbatim reproduction, and verbatim match. Those are three terms that Ruckman uses that are synonyms for our term verbatim identicality. So Ruckman knew and saw the issue with demanding verbatim identicality of wording. He says it's a presumption and he is very clear that this standard is not going to work, okay? And he's saying you don't need to have an exact similitude, a verbatim reproduction, or a verbatim match in order to have God's word the way God intended for you to have it, okay? Now, moreover, Ruckman called the presumption of verbatim identicality through the use of his three synonyms that we just outlined. He calls it gross error twice. So here's once. He calls it gross error. And in the first quote, I believe he calls it gross error. Yes, right here. Gross error. So he thinks it's a gross error to assume verbatim identicality as the standard for preservation. And then he also calls it in the fourth track, he calls it a simple-minded presumption. Notice, because you in your simple-mindedness, my friend, have presumed. So two times he calls it a gross error, and one time he calls it a simple-minded presumption. So, based upon what we've seen so far in this video, it seems to be very clear that Ruckman was not a verbatim identicalist and he did not demand verbatim identicality of wording. Now, this is not all of the evidence. There's more that I could present. And as I've built out this document, there's more, but this has already been a long video, so I'm going to stop it here. So you should stay tuned for more information coming in future videos with more about verbatim identicality in the writings of Peter Ruckman. So, again, we appreciate you tuning in and watching this video. Please consider like it, liking the video, leaving a comment, sharing it if you would. Before I go, I want to remind you about the most important decision that you'll ever make in your entire life is to trust Jesus Christ for your eternal salvation. God loves you. Christ died for your sin. He sent his son, the Lord Jesus Christ, to suffer, shed his blood, and make satisfaction for sin on the cross. And then he was buried and he rose again the third day, the victor over sin and death. God loves you and Christ died for your sin. Stop relying in your works, your performance, your church going, your tithing, whatever it is that you're relying or trusting in to make you right with God. And trust and rely exclusively on his shed blood for you and his resurrection from the dead as the only total complete payment for your sin. Trust Jesus Christ today before it's everlasting too late. Thanks for your attention, and we'll see you next time.